Okay, we're live. Hey, well, let's get moving. We've got 45 minutes and apparently going to get kicked out at the end. Um, so. So I'm just going to give a quick talk on future of RHEL Engine, things that we're doing and things that we'd like to see that are not necessarily going to ever happen, but things <laughs> I, I think would be nice. Uh, optimism, great optimism. Um, all, right. all right, so one of the big things we've spent a lot of time in the last few months working on is Punji. Uh, we've merged, we're, we, we got a new branch of Punji that came from the internal Red Hat Compose tools. It merged in the old Punji with some internal tooling. Um, so a big thing we get from that is that we're now, instead of having just one or two people trying to keep Punji working and making the ISOs, we get a whole bunch of extra functionality and we get extra people to work on the tooling and less appetite. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it works out. I mean, it's a little more configurable in the output, which for some of the things that we'd like to do is useful. It means that, you know, this in ideally, you know, RHEL, CentOS and Fedora will all use the same tooling <laughs> instead of three completely different sets of tooling and wasting, you know, resources and manpower on that. Um, we get a lot better logging. I was going to give a quick, um, if it will work, a quick show of that. Um, Firefox here. I don't know how well this is going to work since. Um, so I, this is the output of the Punji logging. Um, let's go for co compose. You know, we get, you know, logging for the Arch is global logging. Um, but, you know, the, the Punji logging to date has been completely hidden from the view. I mean, the logging has to matter too much, but it's, I mean, it's something that we, that we get. Um, you know, to date, the, the logging happens on a compose box, and the like, QA is like, hey, what was this thing that they have to come to me and s I have to go and find that, you know, with this we get logging where people can actually see it all the time. It spits out some JSON files so that we can write tooling to, you know, trigger off automated composers or you can check what was in it. Um, you know, th th there's a lot of extra functionality that we get. It's also a lot more complex. It does a lot of its stuff in um, Koji. Going forward, we're wanting to look at ways where we can do more of the things in Koji that the Compose process does. So, you know, it makes more transparent. We can see, you know, you can go to Koji and say, hey, where was this thing, rather than having to dig into other places to find it. Um, it's a very useful thing. Where we use the old tooling to do alpha, and we're hoping we get things to the point where we can switch to using the new tooling for the better release for Fedora 23. Um, and we also, part of this is, we end up making Rawhide look like a Compose. Um, but, uh, the mouse goes in. So our long-term um, plans, we want to make the Compose process as completely automated so that you know, release engineering doesn't have to trigger, you know, start things off. We, you know, when a build happens, you know, like a glibc build or a new anaconda build happens, we automatically, you know, run a compose and then we can throw it through a test suite and make sure that, you know, that it works. Um, want to reuse the processes as much as we can. Want to do composes all the time. You know, ideally we get rid of the nightly um, like Rawhide and Branch Compose and we do them on an as-needed basis so that, you know, like if 
Anaconda changes every day. We get a new build every day, but if you know the things in the output don't change, we just don't do anything. Um, you know, it, it's only when the stuff that goes into the, the that you know the deliverables changes that we actually do it. And ideally, we do it much more frequently. Um, would, that, would that be every part of the package on their deliverable changes, or just specific packages? Ideally, it would be every time that a package on the set deliverable changes. I mean, most of that stuff doesn't really change that much. And you know, we could, there would be a gating so that if there's a composing process, we're not going to do another one, but once that's done, if there's five things that need, that say that needs a new compose, we do those five things. And we only do, you know, like if the only thing that changes is a GNOME package, we only go and, you know, make the GNOME install tree and the GNOME and the uh, works the workstation install tree, and the workstation live CD, and that's it. We don't make all the other things. We only make the deliverables that have a changed content in it. Um, that you know, in, in order to be able to do some of this, um, yeah. How, how are you going to fix the signing, the terrible, terrible signing process to deal with that? <laughs> uh, I mean, we've been working on the auto signer stuff, which is generally more broken than working. <laughs> but we, yeah, I mean, ideally, we need a way to be able to sign stuff and trust that it, you know. We, yeah, I mean, we need to define what what does it mean to be for the package to be signed. You know, yeah. to, at the moment, it's the um, you know, if the package is signed, we're like saying, yeah, this is good, this is from us. Um, Longer term, perhaps it's just a means to verify that this thing actually came from Fedora. But you, do, you know, like we would sign the metadata, or we would do some other kind of process where you can have a better verification of what you know the the, the content is, you know, the real content from us, and not something that someone's maliciously you know trojan. I mean, it just means that we would trust the keys a little less that signs the packages rather than. You know, and maybe then we only have a key instead of changing the key every release. And yeah, I mean, this the signing infrastructure is pretty horrible and it breaks frequently. But um, yeah, that's what I, what I was asking about as opposed to um, you know how we auto sign stuff, how we make the signing infrastructure more robust and more. Yeah, I mean, and no one's working on the signing infrastructure yeah. at all. So if anyone wants something. Unsexy and difficult to work on. <laughs> We've got a signing server that could do with, with some love. Um, yeah, uh, there's. I mean, Sigil is. When it was written, it was net. It was right after the incident, and it was a necessary thing. But it's kind of been written and put there and been left alone. Um, It's all. It, is completely Python code. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I, I can point you to the work. I can point you to the researchers at mm -hmm. NYU, uh, NYU who are yep. doing a lot of the work, and they would quite possibly be interested in this. Okay. Um, so yeah, you know, we want to make sure that everything's consistent. We want to enable a framework for supporting different product life cycles. It kind of comes back to the whole ring stuff. You know, today we don't have a good way to say, you know, we want to support workstation for six months and we want to support server for 18 months. We just, we have no way to do it. We can't say, you know, at the end of six months, well, these things are cut off. You know, we need to have a good way to define the different rings, the different products, the different pieces. You know, part of it comes down to, you know, if we want to automate, you know, and just read, we go, oh, well, this package in the workstation's changed make the workstation things, we need to know what's in that so that the tooling and the processes can run. Um, but you know, we, we need to have a way so that we can, you know, like once the workstation product is end of life in six months, we cut off all the Git branches so that, you know, I mean, they exist, but you can't, you know, commit to it, you can't do builds from it, you can't try to push updates 
from that kind of stuff. So that you can, we can say, you know, workstation is supported six months and that's it. But in you know, Fedora 23 on, and you know, maybe longer term, we just want to get away from having, you know, like release numbers and do different levels of rolling releases where we have, you know, a stable, a ultra stable and development and, you know, we just kind of promote things at different you know, stages and make you know the, the the more stable ones have a lot less churn and a lot you know a lot less change but you know like once every six months we promote a whole bunch of stuff and you know people do it they yum update or they get you know the, or the pack, you know, package kit says hey you've got you know there's a, there's a big update here and there's you know 500 packages and that's it where you know we make things a little easier but um, you know, to to be able to support like the different rings concepts and you know like Anaconda and the the base like OS, you want that to never be broken. You know, like ideally we get to a point where you know like Rawhide is never broken because we make sure that anytime somebody pushes a pat a package in update in, you know, if it bumps the surname in, um, say libicu or something that is part of the. Ins I'm not sure if that's part of the installer, but if it's part of the ins you know that that core group, and we detect that the surname's bumped, we then create a side tag and we go off and you know trigger builds for everything that builds against that in the side tag, and we don't allow it to get merged until nothing's broken, and you know that way we can be more sure. I mean, it, it, it's going to slow down some things getting in, but it's not really because you when you push something in that's broken, that then means that nothing else is able to work and you know, you've got to go and build these things. You can't actually install it and do the updates until everything's built against it anyway. So if we just push it off to the side and make it easier to have people do those things on the side or you know, w instead of having you know, the known side tags, you know, they build the first known package that breaks stuff, we put it on the side automatically and, cre and the automated systems do all that kind of stuff for us. Uh, you know, it need, it's something that would, needs to be set down and you know thought through a lot more and come up with a plan and get resources because it's way more than you know the Relange team of you know which was one is now like four people. It's way more than we can take on, and it involves a lot more than just you know Relange. It needs a lot of QA, QA buy-in because without automated QA tests that we can trigger doing things on and you know pushing out things only when they've passed the QA tests, we can't do it. So you know like we need to work with QA and get a consistent cohesive plan as a project to ensure that you know things can run smoother and faster. I mean, ideally, I'd like to push updates when they come out. You know, it, when when you go to Bodai and you say, you know, push this to stable, it goes out automatically. It runs a bunch of tests and makes sure that, you know, some sanity checking that nothing's broken, but then pushes it out, and mm -hmm. it's pretty transparent. Ideally, we push a lot less updates than we do today because I think we push way, way too many updates. I mean, by the time Fedora 20 got towards end of life. I think the Fedora 20 updates repo was somewhere in the vicinity of about 10 gig. It was quite, you know, quite Fedora a 20 was a little bit interesting because 21 had such a long cycle. Right. So 20 I mean ended up being supported for an older 18 months. I mean, ni ni 19 and 20 ended up being supported for about 19 months uh, yeah. as opposed to 13. 13. So um, that's but e even I mean, twenty one mm -hmm. to the today is pretty large, and the the process for us to push updates takes about eight to ten hours. We just don't have a good way to get things out quickly. We need to sit down and you know relook at that. Um, I want to integrate secondary arches better. So uh, I've said for a long time I want you know when we do a compose, I want to do the compose for the secondary arches. I think the best way for us to do that is probably to bring the building of the secondary arches into the primary koji. And it, I mean, my initial thought was to keep it at the kojis as it is and you know, write tooling and stuff to just go off and do the things on the different arches. 
but you know, after talking with Peter and some other people, I think the best option is bring the building of everything in and use the tooling as part of like our defining that you know this is a, and it kind of makes a lot more sense with the I six eighty six talk of having you know some parts of thirty two bit x eighty six no longer being primary. Um, if we have the tooling that defines you know, in our thing that defines what is, you know, Fedora and what's in the different pieces, we can then say, you know, workstation x86-64 is primary, and that's it. Server, you know, we're going to have ARCH-64, um, maybe PPC, um, x uh, yeah, so I, you know. the concept being we're going to uncouple the concept of Koji being and where the Koji exists mm -hmm. from whether it's a primary architecture right. or not. So and then you can demote a addition. So you could maybe promote IoT on 32 bit for primary, primary. C yeah. and you can demote 32 bit x86 server to secondary. Right. And and because you're basically uncoupling the concept of Koji and the builds mm -hmm. versus right. a primary and or secondary arch. Th then the the tooling that you know creates Fedora it's the thing that, you know, what defines is what's primary and what's secondary is where do we ship it? Do we, you know, do we push it to old stage? Do we push it to, you know, Fedora secondary? Do we push it to the main Fedora, you know, repo? What, you know, the, the thing that then would define it is, you know, the tooling puts the things into the different places and how we ship it is what defines what's primary and secondary. I mean, I Or even, well, sorry, it's more policy Defined yeah. primary and secondary, right. and the tooling such as Koji and the release engineering process is adjusted to deal yeah. with that. And basically, the difference then um, is, you know, whether it goes to this area or whether it's promoted on the website, or not, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, at the moment things are being dictated by, like right. things are being dictated by tools now mm -hmm. that shouldn't be dictated right. by tools, but should be dictated. Yeah. I mean, we, we don't have a lot of flexibility in a lot of the things that we've done because we wrote the tooling and we started doing the, you know, wrote the processes when we did Fedora, Core se uh, Fedora 7 and we're using the same tooling, same processes and then we've bolted things on and it's, you know, time we kind of just sit back and go, we need to reevaluate how we do this because longer term it's just not working. Maybe the rings concept changes the way too that we look at primary and secondary, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because if Completely. Like what you say is every every actual support needs to have ring zero right. building and, and working, right? And and the and everything else just is the thing that I found in the five or so years that I've dealt with like non X eighty six arches in Fedora, there's been a number of times where we've discovered tool chain issues on non-X86 arches that are in fact fairly major problems on X86 as well. Um, and we often don't find out about them until later on because the secondaries by definition like, and so at the core, like the Fedora core central bits, um, ultimately ha having the secondary arches in there or the non-X86 arches in there actually will provide, or does provide value to the yeah. 86 arches as well. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing is even in the x 86 where we could do with some subdivision for the ring. And the, the, the work that we just picked up last week for trying to bring down the dependency set for a minimal install or a base, which is yep. not warmly defined, but we always have the problem that Every two or three years, we have an effort like that, and the dependency mm -hmm. only grows over time. And there's no formal ring sets around yeah. what we expect to be the minimal. It, it's but not every two to three years in Fedora. It, it is something yeah. that I am dealing with constantly. Yeah. And but it is something I'm dealing with on a release to release, um, very ad hoc manner. <laughs> yeah. Where you're sitting there basically playing whack a mole. Yeah. yeah. But there's nothing great that will flag me when another dependency set goes in. You know, no. there's no small module, right. number, small base, which suddenly breaks when it's dependent on our satisfaction.
So, I mean, well, there is, so, but, you know, it's, it's, you know the, 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 the I mean, yeah. No, no, there are other things that break when it explodes, because, like, the fedora are minimal build, but shrunk it down to enough that basically if something explodes, it starts to fail because it doesn't fit in the, the allocated no. space we have for it yet. But it, it's fairly ad hoc, and it, yeah, if you're not me, you don't know about no. it. So, so t today, when we do, like, the branch or the, the raw height compose, we get we run repo diff, which says these are the packages that changed and this is their size, but it doesn't consider, you know, oh, this package added five or ten dependencies or yeah. whatever, um, and we get the broken dependencies. Well, ideally, we don't ever have the broken dependencies get out to the real world. Um, and, you know, if, if we have the tooling and the processes in place where we know what goes into everything, we can then write tooling or a reporting that, you know, we can go, you know, between this workstation compose and this workstation compose, these three packages were added. And as part of our, you know, like nightly or automate our compose process, we can, you know, the output part of it can be, you know, these are the, these are the packages, you know, this is the repo diff between what changed. But in these deliverables, these are the things that changed in that, you know, yeah, so, you, so you can see real easily that, you know, oh, somebody, you know, changed um, glib, which added dependencies on a whole stack of Perl. Yeah, this, and this addition suddenly added 300 packages overnight mm -hmm. when it all went wrong. Right. And there's a, the thing that's confusing with Tendling here is we're, I believe, running in parallel with the CI talk. Yeah. But one of the missing pieces here is how do you find these things during, um, so during the, the whole workflow from the developer point of view, mm -hmm. the developer sees that. Yeah. I mean, the the CI, the Koshai CI <laughs> stuff, at least as far as I know, it's mostly trying to preemptively detect fails to build from source. So when you know G GCC changes, it rebuilds everything that build that uses GCC. And yeah, it, it fixes a little bit of the problem. It, 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 it addresses some of the issues, but it doesn't address all of the issues. Yeah, you still need the same kind of. Uh, yeah. I know there's discussion about um, like bringing those failures. Like I know in the enterprise product, I discovered a bunch of failures of cool stuff <coughs> just before the last or well, fairly close to beta of the last release going out, and there was stuff like that that I we should have been picking at the point in which it's built. So that um, you know the developers are aware of it, and that's exactly the same in Fedora. Um, no. this, this is one of the reasons. Like a couple of years ago, I was just here talking about Beta, no. and that it, that I don't think we're using that for any engineering tools to actually to pick up a bunch of this stuff that are already given. Um, yeah. so like we did a task earlier this year trying to install Beta and rebuild an automated task. No. Um, I mean, th there's, pr there's yeah, QA yeah. tests that we could. Sort of out of time as a to look at, but I don't even know that functionality is in there. Yeah, right, and, but this is the thing, our CI tools are built on the same thing. Yeah. 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 The knowledge of the software is out there yeah. and it's completely open, but the knowledge of how to use it effectively is all locked up inside Red Hat Firewall. Yeah. Yeah. And so even Red Hat is not going to have to use it from. Yeah, but I mean, um, even with in the firewall, we don't yeah. have a lot of effective communication around that they have some kind of already X, Y, Z. Because every time I just go, usually try to sort of have the other issues aside. But, but, but this is this is the yeah. thing is that we've just got and, and that we, we need to both do the usability work to say what's preventing people from getting started with it, how do we smooth that on ramp, how do we how do we ease people into using it because it's got the very advanced capabilities but people are hitting the front end of it and bouncing off yeah. and going and reinventing it badly. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, we we we're good at deciding oh this isn't work right and rather than figuring it out just reinventing something yeah. but uh, um, th this QA test that we could run as early as when you commit yeah. You know, like as soon as you commit stuff especially if you're pushing your table to look aside cache 
we should unpack the table and run a license check on it and yes. see if any licenses have changed. And you know, there's a lot of QA stuff that we should be doing that we don't because we just have never we just done it. Have the cyclists yeah, have I, mean, yeah. We're I mean, there are only so many of us working on test automation. If uh, people want to help, I am more than happy to get some of that stuff working. But we're no. already we're busy just trying to get the the structure up so you can yeah. run that kind of stuff. I mean, even Mindless. some of the Taskatron stuff that gets run once you create an update. That's almost too late but for that. But is not limited to just when the update's created. Right. It runs off a fed message. The whole design of it is, hey, you made it, you made it commit. Hey, mm -hmm. you did something to look aside cache. Yeah. You did those kind of things. It can run actions on yeah. those. It's right. just Need you to don't have anything. Yeah. It is just running stuff on Koji builds and updates right now, but it's not limited to that. Mm -hmm. The only reason it's only doing that is because we have only so much bandwidth to write the actual test. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but I mean, yeah, generally, the way that is a bunch of other people mm -hmm. looking at Git, Git commit book stuff yeah. and things like that. But none of that's happening <coughs> in the open, which means that all can't use it. Or in a lot of cases, we're not even aware of who's yeah, the, 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 they're doing it. So yeah. I'm hearing you, there's a lot of good ideas here. Mm -hmm. And as you said, you have four people in Rally, which we have, you know, I don't know, three people in the community working on test automation, whatever. This is way more stuff than we can do in the next month. So has right. someone sat down and figured out like a concrete roadmap with priorities and said, these are the three things we're going to do in the next two months? Or do we just have this vague bundle of good intentions? Uh, no, for Fedora well End, we have a okay. bunch of very defined things that we're right. trading them. Uh, uh, and and the other people can look at? Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, where, um, um, where do you find it? Yeah. We're, we're uh, using Tiger. Uh, mailing list. Oh, yeah. we're, we're using Tiger to do product <laughs> management and we have like daily scrums and so we're... Tiger, the public Kanban board. No. Okay, so that's five different places I've just been... Yeah, no, it's all the same thing. It's one place. <laughs> it's one place. It, it's one place, we're, but we're, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to be much more transparent and better about what we're you know what we're doing, and you know, right. I mean, it, it's it's a lot of change. We're pulling some of the people that have only ever worked inside of Red Hat into doing stuff because they use the tooling internally. Right. You know, the guys that work on the Punji code internally, we're pulling them into doing stuff in Fedora because you know Fedora and Rel are now going to be using the same tools to be creating the OS. So I was just looking at the Fedora project. Which Right. The, 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 yeah. The wiki hasn't been updated. The yeah. all the Scrum stuff started yeah. in the last yeah. six <laughs> weeks, and okay. the wiki page is probably like two years out of okay. since it's been edited. I mean, <laughs> some significant policy changes in Fedora around updates. Yep. You mentioned it takes eight hours to put mm -hmm. an update, and that's yep. relevant work. That is just I mean, mo Most of it's the stuff running in the background, but well, it's... But, but the updates you know. fire hose that we The updates fire hose is crazy. Yeah, and it's never slowed down. No. Ever since we merged Core and Xbox, mm -hmm. it's been that way. Yep. So has that ever been discussed? With it has been, and I mean, you... There's a lot of people with a lot of opinions about oh, I'm very sure. strong sure. opinions about it. Well, I would say, I would say, you know, obviously a lot of package maintainers use the updates model mm -hmm. to push things on their own schedule. That's right. fine, but with things like Copper and stuff, they can do that on their own. You can say, look, yeah. updates are going to be security and critical only, mm -hmm. period. And they have to be true. I, 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 yeah, and who's going to do that extra work? The, there's, yeah. 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 So I mean, I think you know, that's something that. Well, doesn't have the time to do no, that. and I'm, I'm not saying um, that I, th I think a big, but big way to important. change that is to yeah. change rawhide. Yeah. If we can make rawhide to the point where, you know, I, I think we'll have to rebrand rawhide in, in the process because rawhide mm -hmm. has this connotation that it kills babies, it kills kittens, it 
it does, you know. It, it, well, I can still do that, but you want to Right. <laughs> but, um, so I think that, like, by re I think it's part of it we'll need to rebrand Rawhide to something else so that it kind of, yeah. Um, but making sure, make, yeah, making sure that, that at least the core part is never broken. And the outer rings, you know, we may go, you know, stuff that's in server, stuff that's in workstation, stuff that's in cloud, and stuff that's in the core ring, it can never be broken. If it's broke, you know, if your update breaks that, then it's going to get pushed onto the side and we have to have a policy engine that deals with what we do based on that. You know, the leaf stuff, if it breaks, it breaks, whatever. Um, but by making that core really s solid and stable and ensuring that it never breaks, ideally that then, you know, would give the incentive to the developers that that's where they want to be. So then they push their stuff only to the, you know, only to the, the you know the the development branch and that's where the, you know that's where they stay all the time is in the development branch and the stable stuff then by nature of people you know the the developers not being the ones using it but the end users being the ones that use it uh, it's likely to only get bug fixes and security fixes. So that I, I agree with that and I, I, I think that I don't I don't know that it's you know like a perfect answer but well no no I think I think that's that's definitely what we should be striving for and really over the past however many years, I think that's what the Fedora update system has organically, you know, grown into, is that it's basically raw. Mm -hmm. the, the concept of the unstable and stable branches, and you guys have way too much work to do to keep that going. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, if we can get people to shift over to the other one, mm -hmm. that ought to be good for that. I, 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 I think that we, if we put enough, you know, automated stuff around it, where you know people don't go, oh, it's a you know it's a blocker. You know, every time I push something, it gets pushed off the side, and I have to go do. You know, if we make things too hard, people are just gonna complain and push back. And it it has to work, and it has to be quick, and it has to not get in people's <coughs> road. But if we can do that, then I think that you know that'll be the place where people should be. And I think that there's a, there's so much inbuilt negative connotation with the name of Rawhide that. You know, as part of doing that. I mean, maybe we keep rawhide where we just keep shoving stuff and we kind of ignore it. You know, I mean, Susan kind of did the same thing. They, I think it is tumbleweed. The the, you know, fairly stable. They run a bunch of water. You know, they do the comp they do like four or five composers a day when I was talking to them, and they run it through auto QA. And it's only once they've installed, it, you know, run through their test of install suite stuff that they then make that available. And it adds a, you know, a slight delay in that, but it means it's a better, you know. But they still have the factory where they just shove all this stuff and you can use it if you want, but. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that model works well and, and there's, you know, similar, similar sort of concept with the, the nightly builds and mm -hmm. stuff that's for, uh, for Realm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the problem with doing that at the release level is that if something breaks and you then have to have no release for two weeks while that one thing is being fixed and then we have to give loads to the work. It's not like a package level. Then okay, you've not told the one package but the the rest of the release still going out. Um so yeah, I mean the the thing would be that like once the build's done, it needs to run some suite of tests, you know, like check surnames. You know, if a surname bump happens way down low in the chain, you want to push that off to the side and get everything built against it and not push it in until it's done. So in theory, you, you're always going to have something out there, and it's going to happen, you know, frequently because stuff is changing. But you, you know, th there may be things in the pipeline that are happening on the side that, as they, you know, at least unbreak stuff, it can then come in. So the the, the what would be you know, rawhide or whatever, you know, replaces rawhide, would be this stable thing that's at least the core part of it is never broken, and you know if someone pushes a change that breaks that core part of it, it gets pushed off to the side where you know it can be dealt with and once it's dealt with it can then come in, but not until it's being dealt with properly. So we don't just shove the stuff in and go, oh crap, this broke the world. And then we get into the situation where, you know, Anaconda 
can't be, we, you know, we can't create and install for three weeks because the package set that gets installed in for the Anaconda runtime doesn't depth solve, which yeah, happens. I mean, it's not just DNF, but I yeah. I mean, it, it happens that, you know, people <sighs> tend to be overzealous DNS. with what they push and they don't necessarily realize that, you know, by pushing this thing, it actually affects these, you know, 50 other things that use it so because... Yeah, but I mean, it's not necessarily what it wants to be. Right. I mean, there, there's, there's a whole bunch of projects that should be, you know, doing a whole bunch of CI stuff on their source before they even cut a tarball to push it as an RPM. Mm -hmm. So that they know before they even do that that they've absolutely broken the API. And, I mean, if, if upstream projects, whether they're Red Hat or otherwise, aren't doing that. We have a number of other product problems that unfortunately Relange can't fix. And, you know, even with, you know, people sending emails to managers to shit on, you know, Relange, it, it doesn't help because it's not something that we can fix. It's not fixable. We may have this problem with their products all the time. Mm -hmm. When we've got very heavy dependencies on some of the uh, dynamic languages, and they have cultures where APIs are simply not suitable. If you get Joy a good Ruby, Ruby, yeah. Ruby, yeah. Java is, is really not going to be in Ruby particularly bad. Yeah. Security things are going to be in that case. Yeah. And that's seen as normal. Yeah. So, you know, this is not something that tooling itself can fix. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. It, it, I mean, the tooling is not going to fix it, but the tooling and the process that detects it, and like and then you have the have a have a policy of engine of some description that goes. Well, this is in ring zero. It can never be broken. And let's take it onto the side here. Let's either automatically rebuild things or send notifications to people that hey, this thing has had its own name bump. So if we did, if we detect as soon as it's built that it's broken stuff, we can then you know deal with it before it ever becomes something that's visible to you know the users, and we can you know highlight to the developers that you know this change you just pushed. Has caused you know these fifty things to break, and you know deal with it deal with it appropriately. Oh. So, got a bunch of ways to get there. Hopefully, Koji two will enable us to do a lot more of the compose stuff inside of Koji. Load i two, which is going to be deployed next week, means that um, well yeah next week I think is going to deploy Load i two. It should mean that we have a bit more flexibility with our updates. Just stuff. Say things like that. I mean, start getting your buzz. <laughs> what? <laughs> there will be two going to be deployed next week. Yes. yes. And I told you that I was going to. I don't think I'm going to do this. I just, I just wanted to give you a heart attack. Um, yeah, you know, all the work we're doing in in Punji. You know, we we need to be able to quickly iterate over everything. We need to have like which I think we're going to go with the product definition center at least to look at it um, as a tool that defines what goes into each of the products so that we can keep track of you know what goes into composers what came out of it we can you know get stuff get implementing the things to give us the ability to implement rings and define what's in each of the different products and be able to support different life cycles and all of that kind of stuff Maybe Docker. I just throw it in there because it's the cool thing, and we need to be willing to fail. <laughs> yeah, we we we, we need. I mean, we, we we need to be willing to fail. We need to try things and then go. You know what? This didn't work. Let's take a step back and reevaluate it. Historically, we've not done a good job of that. It's like we've got to keep this. It's like we're in a big huge big locomotive and we're going to keep it moving and we're just going to keep it moving. We can't ever stop it. We can't ever take it backwards and, you know, we, we need to, we can't do that anymore. If Koji knew how to build and strong DS and knew how to arrange RPMs or repository assigned RPMs, would you use Punji anymore? Yeah. Um, so it, the, the, you know, like Punji triggers off like live CD builds, appliance. Well, it's going to trick off live appliance builds. Right. 
um, the Docker. We, we we need. I mean, yeah, but we we need to have. For a plugin, it doesn't actually build itself. Right. I mean, it's, so what what Punji it is? Punji. No, it doesn't. Punji. Yeah, it does for Docker, not for anything else. I mean, a lot of the images call out to Image Factory or right. its live media creator. Right, but it's a task handling image. Yeah. yeah, the integration is tight. Right. right. The integration in Goji is tight. Um, so, it, yeah. It, yeah, I mean, if if we have the ability to do each of the things, I mean, we need to make atomic repos. We need to sit back and, I mean, we, we had this plan when we implemented the atomic stuff and we make the repos and it's really not working very well. We need to step back. We need to reevaluate how we make the atomic repos. Yeah, how the, how the work. Atomic is important to other people. Right. I mean. I'm asking about if Koji can build the things that Punji built, do we need Punji? We don't necessarily need Punji. We need to have something that orchestrates. I mean, and, and, and maybe we don't need Punji longer term. Maybe if we put everything into Koji and we have, you know, like in PDC and we have something that's watching and goes, oh, you know, this thing is just being built and it in, you know, in the product definition it says, you know, it's in the workstation, let's go off and make that thing. Um, Maybe yeah. Satsicon in the future for yeah. running under the bus? Well, we were talking to Satsicon, would you credentials to be able to kick that off? And Satsicon no. doesn't QA network, which we shouldn't have. It, 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 it may be that we don't necessarily need, you know, Punji or what Punji is, you know, going forward, is not going to look anything like what Punji is today. I mean, ultimately, you need a bunch of code to do it, whether whether you, yes, you know, know, shoot or, or yeah. want it into Koji or, or whether it's fine as Punji, I, I don't think it makes any difference. It's, doesn't, it's still doesn't essentially make going to be a no. bunch of code that's similar to what it is now, yeah. because yeah. the output will still need to be, at the moment, similar yeah. to what they are now. Punji needs a lot of environment-specific stuff set up, and it needs a lot of yeah, it does. It, it, it's a, it's a little clunky. Yeah, and oh, yeah, but I mean, they're very similar settings you set up code. Like you can True. Pick, you can yeah. pick you can pick which pile of completely undocumented code you want to stare at. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, longer term, you know, what Punji is and may not look anything like what it does today. Yeah, and it just may be you know the, the name that's the same. Like good Punji. No. I mean, so Rawhide oh, changes I'd like to make there. Automatic side tags when, like, so names and stuff bump so that we can, you know, deal with it. Have automated build QA so that whenever a build is completed, you know, we, I mean, ideally, I guess in, a, in the ideal world, we tag it, the build when it's completed into, like, a pending tag. We run a bunch of automated QA, we check so name, we check, you know, like, licenses, RPM, diff. You know, all sorts of whatever whatever checks we can think of to run on it. We sign the RPM, and it's only once you know all the QA's passed that's signed, it's tagged in. And ideally, that takes no more than you know three to five minutes, because if you start adding a huge delay before that build gets into build routes and stuff, people will you know fight against it and complain and try to work around it and not work with us. Um, you know, we want to sign the RPMs in Rawhide. Over the years, from time to time, people were like, "Why, why is Rawhide not signed?" And uh, the the way everything works today, it's just not possible to really do it. Um, make th I want, you know something that we should be turning on, hopefully before F twenty three better is is Rawhide will look like a release compose. We're going to make the workstation edition install, you know, the network install tree and the the live the server deliverables, like all of the things that we make as part of a release compose is going to be rawhide. So yeah, that's happening in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. That, that should be, you know, we should be making the steps and making that happen. You know, the live CDs will be on the mirrors and you won't have to go to Koji and go, where do I find the task for the last working, you know, workstation live CD and well, stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you know, fully implement the ring stuff that Matt's been going on about for you know, a few years now. I think I think the term is officially deleted. 
Well, what does it mean? It means that you know we can. We we still need to define completely what all of that is, but you know, at least from my understanding, like the ring zero would be the minimal installation that and the stuff that's in the work in the base working group of A, minimal installation, anaconda, and its dependencies. That that core and stuff that you part. that you need to be able to run an anaconda to do a minimal install. Um, yet to be defined, but 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 yeah, but d yeah, you know, yeah. we we kind of still need to define that. We're out of yeah. time, so if anyone has more questions or. It is a mouse. It's a conspiracy. It's a very good question. I assume that we are going through a modernization, which is great, and mm -hmm. I wanted to do it. But after that, the next step would be allowing layer product on tops on Fedora. Because um, now we've been working on the infrastructure side, and the problem is that we have a very different schedule than Fedora. Mm -hmm. We need to write packages. Yep. That's why some projects are leaving Fedora, which is concerning. Yep. Um, and what I wanted to do is, at some point, we would be able to say, OK, you, you won't be Fedora, but you would be able to date the product of Fedora. Yeah. Maybe reusing Rains engineering, for instance, like separate tree pool and maybe images. Would maybe. It, it, it's something to be looked at. I mean, maybe we do it as in Florian and Koji, mm -hmm. or maybe it's done in Copper. Yeah. Um, copper doesn't stop us. Yeah. Copper is still a bit. Yeah, I, but yeah, I mean, ha having a way to do that kind of, like, support layered image stuff or la layered product stuff in Fedora is, yeah, it's, it's something that, you know, we should, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, all right, well, thank you all.